It was so amazing to see you here. I love seeing this room fill up with people. You are, you are my babies. This is awesome. <laughs> it is 9 a.m. on a gorgeous Saturday summer morning, and for some reason you're inside here. I know why I'm here. I'm on the schedule, and Brian would have chased me down. Um, you showed up to, to learn Python, certainly, but also to participate in the Python community, and Brian was absolutely right. The community is... I would actually rate it above the language. If all of you people decided you were going to go and become COBOL for programmers, I think I would follow you, um, just because I love you. So today, I am usually I have a cool tool and I let that do the work, and I basically just stand here saying, "Look at how cool this tool is." Um, today, you're actually going to spend a long time hearing my opinions, so we will see how valuable that is. Uh, the general topic is open source society, and I'm not really talking about just our society here. I'm talking about society as in sociology. Maybe I should have called it open source sociology. Uh, I've been introduced already, but a few little other tidbits. I'm a Minnesotan. I'm permanently stranded here in the Deep South. I live in Dayton. Um, I'm a I was supposed to be a chemical engineer. I blundered into database administration, and now I keep one foot in the DBA world and one foot in the Python world. Uh, aside from you, my other claim to fame is writing the SQL extension to IPython, which I wrote in pretty much in one frustrated weekend after losing a job. So anger-driven development is pretty cool. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, indeed, I was the first chair, it, and I've just been amazed. Uh, I did not start PyOhio. It took about 100 people, attendees and volunteers, to show up and start PyOhio. Um, I did share, and that was really cool, and I'm really proud of it. And it's kind of like what multi-level marketers tell you it's going to work like. You're just going to put in a lot of work, and then you're going to have this downstream that just like forwards you karma for the rest of your life. That's kind of what PyOhio is doing for me. It was pretty cool. The other awesome thing is that I am your employee. Uh, I work, f uh, unless you're Canadian. Canadians, I love you. Do we have anybody else? I don't know how many non-U.S. citizens we are, but I work for a digital consultancy within the federal government called 18F. So I am your tax dollars at work. Basically, this is a group of folks, hardcore, open source, agile, sourcey. They are just like you. Um, and we do work for other parts of the federal government, and we do it the right way. We absolutely insist every byte open from the beginning. We use open source. We contribute open source. It's a thrill, it is, seriously. So you, you'll see the little 18F logo on here. I'm going to be plugging us throughout. Um, also, a lot of my friends at 18F contributed feedback and helped me do what little research was done. So yay, 18F. OK. I'm going to, spoiler, this is my, my punchline is right here. OK, open source software is going to change the world. That's, you know, you'll hear that at every Linux fest or whatever. We all know that. Software will not be how it changes the world. OK. Mysterious, huh? All right. If you go around chatting with folks, one thing that you can get agreement on from pretty much everybody across the political spectrum, all works of life, is that the world is going to hell in a gigantic handbasket. Um, which is kind of odd, because by objective measures, the world is actually getting a lot better in a lot of ways. I have lines saying so. These are... Uh, <laughs> seriously. And it's on Wikipedia. Um, these are global poverty rates. And you know, those are coming, to, that's a lot of human misery leaving the world. That's good. Um, really, a talk on whether the world is getting better or worse could be a long talk in itself or a bar fight. But the point is, there's a lot of great stuff going on. But there's also a lot of frustration in society. And there's various reasons. But I think one of the big ones is that society is having trouble scaling. Once upon a time, People lived in little tri little bands, not even tribes, bands. Uh, you interacted just with the folks who hunted and gathered around you, and people could deal with that. And ever since then, society's been scaling up and up and up and up. Tribes, kingdoms, nation states, globalization, it's not just a buzzword in in-flight magazines. Um, and that has all brought a whole lot of benefits, but it's also really hard for us to adapt to. Uh, globalization even affects us here at, uh, at Pi, Ohio. Do you remember Young Yu Chen? He uh, was one of our volunteers and participants a few years back. He went back home to Taiwan and helped start up PyCon Taiwan, or as I like to call it, Pi Ohio Pacific. <laughs> the trouble is, 
If you've heard of the concept of the Dunbar number, this is the notion that our brains are wired to understand a social environment, a social universe of maybe 150 people. And you know, they argue, is it 150, is it 200, whatever. But the point is, my instinctive ways of relating to people cannot cope with anywhere near the scale we're working with these days. In fact, can probably only cope with about half of the room. So please don't look at me, I can't, you know, you're shorting out my brain. Um, so how do we deal with the fact that our world is at a much, much bigger scale? Basically, we have developed, I guess you could call them technologies, for managing ourselves. Really, this is managing our cooperation with each other. The first one was hierarchy. So you don't have to deal with everybody, just your circle and your boss and your underlings, OK. Uh, regulations, written laws became another way. You don't exactly have to deal with people. You just have to read the rules and comply with the rules. The marketplace, um, things you don't have to deal with people, just price tags. This service is $36 an hour, OK. Um, that's how we've managed to scale. And you know, it's working. Nobody here is beating each other with a stone club. Um, but it's not really all that satisfactory. And this applies to our governments, our businesses, our private organizations. Pretty much everything we do faces this scaling problem. I think a lot of you might recognize this quotation. You take a little look at that and say, yes, yes, I know that. I worked there. Um, our institutions are frustrating. They, are, they can seem mindless. They can seem inhumane, inhuman. But they can seem malicious, which is really weird because they're full of people who, by and large, are reasonably intelligent and have a reasonable amount of goodwill. So we're facing real scaling problems. So much of our culture's humor focuses on, is gallows humor about how badly our institutions work. So I think that's where our, our impression of the handbasket is coming from. Uh, our government, pretty much everyone will agree, the government can't do anything right. It's a basket case, it's a mess. And the scary thing is, we're not complaining about a foreign government imposed at bayonet point. This is a democracy. We're complaining about ourselves. We have lost confidence in our own ability to manage our society. And when the world's leading, the citizens of the world's leading nation, again, I love you Canadians, think that way <laughs> about themselves, I think that's, that's like a civilization crisis. I'm really scared. We need some revolutionary change to deal with this. Fortunately, we have a revolution on the stovetop right now. Um, I would say that the information revolution really is up there in scale in its impact with the agricultural and industrial revolution. I mean, this is a big deal. It's affecting everything, not just the economy, but it's affecting how we live, permeates the whole mess. And these kind of revolutions do more than just their immediate economic impact. If you ask me, what was the impact? You know, tell me about the Industrial Revolution. What did that mean? What does the, how does that affect society now? And I say, well, the Industrial Revolution started with power looms, and more or less. And so as a result, we have cheap fabric. That's the result of the Industrial Revolution. You're thinking, well, no, there's a little bit more than that, right? And I say, well, it means you can buy Pi Ohio t-shirts. Those are cool. Um, no. The changes started with the fabric industry. They went on into other industries. And then they went beyond industry. They started reshaping society, the way people interact with each other. They started reshaping our minds. We think in paradigms that are built a lot around industry. Those replaced a lot of the agricultural paradigms, which in turn replaced a lot of the hunter-gatherer paradigms. And now we've got a new revolution, the information revolution coming up. And it's not clear yet how that's going to reshape our society and our ways of thinking, but I'm pretty sure that it is. And one of the interesting things is, so the agricultural revolution scaled our food supply. That was cool. Industrial revolution scaled our supply of stuff. That's cool too. Information revolution, of course, is scaling our uh, supply of information. That's cool, but there's something else it's doing. Because more, I think, than the other revolutions, the information revolution, and in particular the open source part of the information revolution, is figuring out ways to scale the way that people deal with each other. There are over 20,000 contributors to the Python package index. That's people who have 
put a package up there. That alone would make just the Python world one of the tech giants right up there with Google and Microsoft. And that's neglecting the fact that there's a lot more than package owners. There are people who contribute code and patches and who write documentation and who teach courses. And all these contributions, if you really added it up, the Python world is actually, it scales really, really big. And the Python world is only one small part of the open source world. We are scaling. And we are not scaling the ways that everything else scales. We are scaling with very little hierarchy, very little marketplace, very little, what was my third one? Um, regulations, thank you, okay. Um, we're working out different ways that people can interact with each other and cooperate that are really different from the paradigms that society has mostly been relying on. In that sense, and because we're working on these, we are a laboratory. Every day people are figuring out better ways to work together, working out new tools, working out techniques and attitudes. I think that is going to be the big way that open source is going to change the world. Some caveats. Um, I'm going to be really sloppy, you know, information technology, open source, agile. I'm going to talk as if it's all kind of one big ball of wax. And I know there's differences, but it all plays together. I'm going to talk as if open source always goes the way it should, which of course it doesn't. So we're going to be thinking about idealized open source for the most part. And then for the most part, these attitudes and techniques I'm talking about, they're not totally new. People have been doing them for a very long time. Um, this, is a, this snippet here is a, uh, a very early version of the GNU public license from the first century AD. It says, freely you have received, freely give. So none of it's new, but you can take all these attitudes and things and apply them in your hippie commune up in the hills and nobody cares. Um, they think, very nice, that n will never matter to real society. But we are doing this stuff at really large scales and frankly, in economically successful ways, and people pay attention to that. So this becomes not really a scientific laboratory where we invent brand new things for the first time ever, more like an engineering laboratory where we take these concepts that have mostly existed in the abstract, in theory, and show here's how it can apply to the world. Here's how this can actually be put into use by you. So from here, I'm mostly going to take a little tour of the laboratory. What all are we working on in terms of tools and attitudes and techniques? And occasionally I'm going to stop to either show you a way that that's beginning to percolate into the rest of society, or that it could, or that it should. Um, and sometimes I won't, and I'll leave it to your imagination. But I want you to go through this. And yeah, think about the way we use it for software, but then think about pushing that outside the software boundary. Um, this could be a gigantic amoeba of chaos. So I tried to make a little outline to keep track of where I'm going. Um, it's pretty much an infinite topic. But I'm going to start with non-ownership, which is one way to say uh, openness. And I'm going to contrast it to ownership. Since the printing press, it's been really easy to mechanically produce, uh, mechanically reproduce information. But people decided that in order to profit from it, in order for this to be uh, prosperous, we need to have ownership of information. We need patent laws, copyright laws. We need to claim information that we generate. And that's the only way anybody can make a living off it, right? And so society has come to value secrecy in information uh, and legal control. In fact, this idea is so deeply ground in that we think of, we have come to think of secrecy itself as lending credibility to information. Advertisers say, secret formula, patented formula, private information. You can't have it. That's how you know it's valuable. <laughs> Centuries of that, and yeah, you, we chuckle, but you know, you've, you've talked to your, your parents about this, right? And tried to explain open source, and they're like, what? Um, it, it's those attitudes are ground in. And one of the great things that open source is doing is showing that actually that's not the only way to prosper from having information. Um, that you can open things up and you can enjoy commercial success. You can get trust not by saying, I am credible because my information is secret, but you can say, I am credible because you can look inside and critique this information and judge it for yourself. You don't have to 
quench this little seedling of information in your fist. In fact, if you let it have contact with the world, that's how it can grow into a mighty tree. So we're demonstrating that. We're helping show the world that there is another way than information ownership. Uh, we're developing tools, incidentally. Version control, I think at this point it's kind of misnamed. The real use is not just in in versioning, but in cooperation. It's a great way, you know, you give me a pull request and I have a nice and organized way to keep track of what you've submitted, decide how it's going to fit in there, accept it or not, bounce it back, discuss it, keep give you your credit in the future so that, you know, you still feel, for all we don't need ownership, credit is still nice. It's still, you know, nice to have bragging rights. So we preserve that. Version control is a great tool for that, and it's, there's no reason for it to be limited to software, and it is spreading beyond software. I hate to mention a, you know, okay, granted GitHub is a private company, but still it's really helping version control to spread for this. It's a place where people can host information and share, and the really neat thing is that when they're sharing, the default, the easiest and cheapest thing for them to do is to open that up and not quench it, but release it. So I think that is going to be prompting a lot of people to really try out openness and find out that it works. And, you know, I mentioned GitHub specifically, but obviously there's Bitbucket and tons of other services. This is definitely spreading beyond software. I think you've heard about, like, the open hardware movement, certainly. There's a similar open movement springing up, open music and so forth. There's a, a platform called prose.io that is all about helping people author content that is hosted on GitHub. And so all that version control is built right in there. Um, I linked to, I won't click it, I, I linked to an article that discusses all sorts of um, kinds of information that people are starting to share with Git that is not software. Music to recipes. Government is starting to get the clue. I mentioned that 18F has a very strong open source policy. Um, definitely read that when you have the time. Um, basically, we're in demand in the federal government right now, and whenever any part of the government asks us to work on something for them, we say, first thing you got to know, every byte that we write is going to be open all along. That's just the only way we work. And... Um, and we're doing that not just because we're fanatics, because we are, but we want to demonstrate to the rest of the government that this is a viable way to do things. Um, middle managers can have a problem where if it's not the standard way to do it, they're just afraid. And once we have demonstrated several times how powerful this can be for government projects, we're hoping that we raise the bar of expectations. And the question won't be, why did you go with that weirdo, wacky open source technique? The question will be, how come you built something that sucked when you could have used open source? So, um, similarly, uh, the USDS, US Digital Service, is kind of like a sister agency to 18F. Um, they've published a default to, op well, they've published a playbook advising other parts of the government how to do their IT. And it includes this very specific advice that you should default to open. I mean, come on, this is your government. Of course you should have the information. It's kind of amazing that it took this long for this to become the standard, but it is becoming the standard, which is really exciting. Uh, Data.gov, I will, I will click on this one, because um, big storehouse of government open data. If you, if you want a data set, go browsing through here. There is a ton of interesting data sets on all sorts of topics. The, the organization, sometimes you drill in and you find it's like, oh, okay, that's a CSV, whatever. I mean, ideally, it would all be lovely JSONs and everything. but. Um, but again, the open, openness is pushing ahead in government. Um, if you've heard of the Freedom of Information Act, uh, that means that if there's some piece of information that's not actually classified, but the government has, hasn't released it, there's a formal process by which you can nag them to get it. You shouldn't have to. And they are working on just plain releasing more of it in the first place. But another change they're doing, in the past, if you nag me for that piece of information, OK, here you go. Just you. That's ridiculous. So there's a pilot program going on right now to say, when you nag me to release some information, it goes public. Why wouldn't that be the case? It's all coming about. All right. So that was non-ownership. Another big principle of open source is humility. And the opposite of humility is optics. And it's really hard not to worry about optics, not to think about, hold on, how is this going to look? 
We don't want to show our dirty laundry. We don't want people to see the insides because we have to put on a good front. And part of that is emotional. It's really, um, even if there were no businesses or anything, it would take some courage to show people your dirty laundry. But the way that business has developed has made it worse because traditionally we sell stuff by pretending to be perfect. We, um, you might say, our product has been under development secretly for 10 years and only now are we revealing it. And it is perfect. It is just the ultimate product. Give us money. That's very different from the open source way of saying, hey, we gave this a try. See what you think. If you like it, help us make it suck less. Um, <laughs> it's hard to believe that the latter works, but we are demonstrating that the latter works. With, hum with open sourcey humility, you don't sweep your mistakes under the rug. You admit that they're out there. You seek help. You acknowledge when you get it. You do a m minimum viable product. You don't try to keep it uh, to yourself until it's perfect. Fail fast, which means it's OK if, again, you don't put in too much effort before you expose it to the community and say, what do you think? Where are we going with this? Do you like it? Do you hate it? Do you like it, but in a way that we totally hadn't anticipated, and so it goes veering off that way? You're open to all of that. And then you keep on iterating. And you iterate not according to a five-year plan that you set with your um, commissar, but according to what the community ends up needing and contributing. How can this work beyond, um, beyond just software? Well, actually, it's kind of funny that Brian quoted this because I, <laughs> I thought you would like to see a little Pi Ohio history too. So I, I dug up this first message. And you know, sure enough, this first Pi Ohio really embodied a lot of these principles. It was totally a minimum viable product. It was like, let's throw it out there, um, fail fast. You know, we started talking about it in March, and it happened in July. Uh, we could have said, oh, you know, that's going to be a little rinky-dink conference. It's not going to look very professional and polished. Let's wait until we can produce something better that's, you know, really slick and looks good. And if that had been the case, I don't think it would have happened, period. There would probably still be no Pi Ohio. I think that the way we've done Pi Ohio really kind of embodies these. So it doesn't just have to be for software conferences. I mean, it's great with open source people because you do understand the concept of the minimum value viable product and of iteration. But, um, but that attitude, that approach, can spread beyond the software world. Think about how that can apply elsewhere, in businesses, in organizations, in all the stuff you care about. Uh, soft boundaries. These are all related. Um, kind of the opposite of groupthink, where tradition emotionally it's really hard to be open to outsiders, uh, to say, yeah, all your contributions are equal are going to be valued. Emotionally, it's hard not to just value the people you are closest to and you know best. But we recognize that actually those outside contributions are fantastic. We don't want to hoard the credit. We want to share the credit. We don't want to keep to only our own stuff. We want to share that out too. Think about how that's going to apply to your organizations. I know that in 18F, um, all our stuff is on GitHub. And if any of you goes in there and like contribute, you know, files a bug report, even better, contributes a little code or something like that, I guarantee the people who started that repo are going to come into the chat, ch chat channel and they're going to pump their fist and say, yes, outside contributors, we love outside contributors because we've got the open source bug. So let that bug permeate elsewhere. Uh, critique. This is a big and challenging one. Um, Critique is very difficult. It's important, it's, but it's so difficult not to become defensive, both emotionally, because we feel like, oh, you're saying bad things about what I made. I feel like, I feel like you're saying I'm a bad person. And then there's the salesmanship angle. Oh, my livelihood depends on the illusion of perfection, and you're disrupting that illusion. Oh, no. But as open sourcey people, we're beginning to recognize that critique is a form of cooperation that we, oh, neat. OK. Um, we seek it out specifically in code reviews. It's a formal part of many of our development processes. Uh, bug reports are a form of critique, and they're a, it's, it's free QA. This is cooperating with the project. Um, what's a unit test but a formalized way of self-critique? Self 
critique is part of our process of iteration. It's part of how things suck less. I think all professions have used tech, uh, critique. I mean, the, the concept of you know a mentor and a student, this is ancient. But what's interesting is with open source is we recognize it's not a phase that ends. We're constantly open to critique. And we don't say, I accept critique, but only from my mentor, only from my professor, only from my immediate coworkers. No, the whole world is invited, is asked to critique. Now, obviously, this could have a big effect if we carry it out into our organizations and our businesses and so forth. The scariest idea is, what if we even attempt to carry this into our personal lives? What if we allowed people to file bug reports on ourselves? This would be... Um, <laughs> And I hate to even say this, because the other side of the coin is we need to be aggressive project managers of our own lives. And there are people who will submit crappy bug reports. Um, and certainly, I have gotten a lot of bug reports personally that I have responded to with won't fix. But, um, or, or it's a feature, not a bug. Um, nonetheless, I think there is a lot of good, useful advice that we could be giving each other, but we're afraid to give it or afraid to receive it openly because the open source attitude hasn't percolated all the way through yet. So there's a big, fat challenge. And if anyone can really embody that in your lifetime, I'm going to be really impressed. But something to think about. Diversity. I have gotten through 15 years without obeying the unicorn law, and today I violate it finally. <laughs> so mark your calendars. Um, Diversity critique is a form of critique, right? And that means that everything that I've said about critique applies. When you start talking about problems in diversity, typically you will get a lot of pushback with responses like, well, you know, we didn't mean for it to be bad, or, you know, we're not the worst, there's others who are worse. And imagine if that's the way we responded to our bug reports in the software, you know? Well, you know, I didn't mean to make it crash, so I'm not going to fix it. Um, th there are other programs that crash too. I'm not going to fix it. That's ridiculous. Um, critique is good. Critique helps us improve the community. Critique is our way forward. Now, it can be exhausting when you think about all the sorts of diversity that we really should be embodying. Um, all the unit tests, I didn't put up the number of Fs and Es we get. There would be a substantial number of them. Uh, but there's great stuff going on. I have been going to PyCon since 2004. In the beginning, it was roughly 1% female. I could count all the women there on one hand. Uh, if anybody was at the more recent ones, I, I don't remember the percentage. I think it's over a third of attendees and speakers now. Huge change. And it didn't just incidentally happen. There was real intentional effort, um, people putting forward effort in groups like PyLadies and so forth. Um, and it's been fantastic. And there's a lot more broken tests to fix. I'm going to quickly note a few specifics. Uh, has anyone seen the racial dot map? This is basically a visualization of segregation, and it's kind of alarming. I'm, there's Columbus, but I'm actually going to pick on Dayton because I know it better. Um, green dots are where black people live. Um, and you know, aren't you glad that segregation is a thing of the past? Um, now, the other alarming thing is if you look at where the um, tech companies, tech meetups, uh, introductory courses and so forth in technology happen in Dayton. They all happen as close to the corn, as close, as far this way as we can get without getting into the cornfields. What does that say to the people who live over here? Is that welcoming? Um, I don't like the message that sends. So um, just last month, I actually got together with the YWC, YWCA in Dayton, which is an organization that really kicks racism's ass, and we taught a programming class to their day camp. And it's like, look at those demographics. Um, I didn't have to work for it. I just partnered with folks who were already in that community. And incidentally, we chose a location that was not out in the cornfields. Think about this. Think about where your community is acting. Um, I'm just, you, I've threw out disability there. This is just something that has bothered me a little lately. We see very few physically disabled people in here. It's not because of the demands of the job, folks. I don't see anybody walking around with steel girders on their shoulder. This would be a great career for folks with physical disabilities. Where are they? We need their help. Let's get them in there. Uh, this week, I don't think I can talk about diversity without touching on a sad note. Um, Noreen Plunkett was a great open source contributor. 
and documentation contributor and contributor of energy to uh, gender equity. And we lost them just this last week uh, at age 30. That sucks. Um, just want to note their contributions and honor them by pushing on. Growth. Growth seems like a good thing. Everybody believes in growth, right? Growth is, is awesome. Growth means prosperity and everything. But then it turns out that there's a lot of gatekeeping that goes on. There's a lot of sense that new, newbies have to pay their dues. There's weeder courses in college. There's hazing. A lot of the jargon we use, granted some of it is necessary, but some of it amounts to hazing, especially when we forget to document it well. But in the open source community, we understand that growth is good, so we need to overcome this instinct because growth is richness. We struggle because there are packages that haven't been written because those people haven't entered the community. We need the community to grow. We don't want to haze our newcomers. Newcomers are valuable, and not just because someday they're going to be experts. They're valuable now because, among other things, they can help us smooth the on-ramps. They can show us where it's difficult to enter the community. So if you are new to Python, as you hit things that are confusing, please make a note and talk to some other folks. Talk to the folks who do courses, or really any of us, and help us smooth out those on-ramps so that the beginners after you won't be stumbling. And all of us are new to something. You might not be new to Python, but this is the week you're taking on Flask, or whatever it is. Um, remember that your ignorance is a precious commodity and take advantage of it. As far as, um, I think the open source world does a pretty good job of um, valuing our newbies. You see that in all sorts of organizations that are set up to bring them in. We're getting much better at documentation, which is very important for newbies, of course. Um, there are so many tutorials and courses in Python that I swear the last step of every Python tutorial is now write a Python tutorial. Um, <laughs> Tools, I gotta, I gotta jump aside for just a second to, uh, ooh, oh my goodness, did I disturb my screen? What have I done? <laughs> oh no! <laughs> I wonder if, okay, back to my displays. Yeah, what did I do? I wonder if it's... Hello. Oh, that's Ubuntu. <laughs> okay. You know, honestly, I'm close enough to the end that I wonder if I should just push on. Yeah, okay, so, all right, thank you. Um, from this point on, you have to use your imagination. Um, the the IPython notebook, now known as Jupyter, look up Try Jupyter. It's uh, just another um, project that they have produced that lets you, you don't have to install a thing. If you've got a web browser, you can try out the IPython notebook strictly in the web browser and try out a Python course. It's that sort of thing, thinking about, gosh, you know, do I want to make people have to go through all this setup before they can get involved? That kind of thinking is really important. I think we're getting better at it. And if we can carry that notion out into the rest of the world, it's going to change a lot more. Um, I think I'm going to end up uh, going into my question time there, Jim. But interfaces. OK. We are used to, in the proprietary world, going for big scope. And if I, you know, if I produce a piece of software, I tend not to think about how is it going to interface with other software, but say, oh, wait, other software? Why are they using other software? Why don't I just make mine bigger so that people will just buy mine and give me lots of money and let it do everything? Uh, in contrast, in the open source world, we believe in small, sharp tools. I'm going to build my tool. It's only going to do a few things. That's OK. It doesn't rule the world, but it interfaces well with others. And I think, what's the API? How can I design that to be easy to use, easy to understand, and easy to interact with other tools. That means I have to give up some power to predict how you're going to use it, but that's a good thing. Small, sharp tools. We also uh, work on documentation tools, which are being used sometimes to document things other than software. 
Um, Sphinx, there's no reason that I can only document software, for instance. Markdown, uh, I mentioned uh, prose.io. Prose uh, lets you write documents of any sort in Markdown. So, um, okay, that's right, small shop tools. All right. Um, that attitude can go beyond just software. One of the projects I've worked on at 18F is for the FEC, the Federal Election Commission, and we're getting the notion of getting APIs out there more and more into the federal government. The 18F team is still working on the FEC's new official web application where you'll go to browse the data on uh, electoral finance. But before that's ready, we released the API so that you can go in there and yank that data out yourself and build your own applications that use it. That's the attitude that the open source community can bring. It's the attitude that the FEC has adopted. And we can be pushing that throughout the government and really throughout all of our organizations. It's not just teams that should be small and sharp, though. Or it's not just tools. How about small, sharp teams? How about instead of thinking of turf and trying to imagine how your organization can rule the world, how about trying to imagine how your small group can be useful to individuals and to other small groups. Think about the interface. How, what's the API to your group? How can others make use of and benefit from your business, your, your organization, your nonprofit, whatever? I think in that way, we could start to build a new way for people to cooperate. This is not hierarchy. This is not regulation. This is not marketplace. This is small, sharp tools. Um, within my little group, my little Dunbar number brain can handle things because I'm, I'm at that nice scale. And beyond that, that's when we think about interfacial governance. We don't have to rule the world. We ha just have to interface well with it. I don't know what that means, but we've got a laboratory. <laughs> we've got a laboratory, and we're figuring out how we can run the world without mad amoebic demon gods. So... Uh, finally, encapsulation. Ooh, here's where I am missing the slides. So um, you'll really have to use your imagination now. But you've all seen, OK, yeah, I'm going to violate that. Um, <laughs> you've all seen legalese. It's horrible. It's hideous. It's futile. It's really, it's somehow the Industrial Revolution came along and didn't change legalese. It still sounds like, hear ye, hear ye, blah, blah, blah. Um, now, if you look inside one of the software licenses, that looks like that too, but it's encapsulated. It's OK that the BSD license sounds medieval inside, because all I have to say is, oh, I'm using the BSD license. OK, great. Um, of course, that requires standardization. And there was a while when the open source community kind of forgot that, and everybody wanted to be their own special snowflake and have their own special license. But we've kind of gotten over that, and we're coming to a, a limited number of licenses. So that we, that is a way that open source can respond to law is by encapsulating it. Now, imagine if that approach actually penetrated into law itself. Imagine if Ohio, instead of having to say, well, we have to write our own uh, rules for governing uh, uh, apartment rentals. Imagine if we said, oh, BSD apartment rental uh, uh, regulations version 3.0, encapsulated. That would be amazing. Oh, but wait, we're going to want to tweak things. So what if that regulation was templated and said, um, mm, Owner must notify tenant within squiggle bracket, days, end squiggle bracket, and publish the law as JSON. OK. <laughs> That's way out there. Am I dreaming? Yes. Are we in this jetpack future? No. In fact, there are still organizations that are fighting with some individual state governments just to get the text of the state law posted online. Um, what? But, um, but we are getting there. 18F actually was asked to speak at the House of Representatives about the concept of digitizing laws. Um, so there is progress. Uh, I want to plug, again, I wish I could show it. There's a, um, there's a project called E-Regulations from the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau that is taking the, the computer, consumer finance regulations and really making them accessible in a, in a way that looks modern. Now, the regulations weren't written that way. They had to bludgeon them into shape with software. But if we actually start percolating that into our legal processes, then I think that we can, um, law can stop being some hideous drain on everything every organization does, 
and we can start seeing some efficiencies in our governance. All right, where are we? I have great slides. I wish you could see them. <laughs> um, they are actually. Oh, oh and I, it was on the first slide. Okay, it's um, bitly bit dot ly slash pi ohio twenty fifteen keynote, and I also just tweeted it. So Catherine Devlin tweet. Uh, Twitter account, you should be able to see it there. So, my premise was, we will change the world and not through software. The, we are in a laboratory of cooperation. We are working out techniques that people can cooperate with. We are proving that those techniques can apply to the real world. Now, you are all my scientists and my engineers working in this laboratory. And remember, a great scientist doesn't just lock the door of the laboratory at 5 p.m. and go home and call it a day. A great scientist takes her, homework, her work home with her and experiments on her neighbors. That, <laughs> that is what we can do. That is what we need to do. And I think that is, how, that is how society is going to scale. So thank you all so much. And have a fantastic Pi Ohio interface, interface, interface to hell with the Dunbar number. Have a great time.